In the spring of 1976, Teton Dam, an earthen dam just north of Rexburg, Idaho, was the site of the most significant failure of a Bureau of Reclamation project in the agency's history. The failure of Teton Dam would serve as the catalyst for Reclamation's dam safety program. The pioneers of the dam safety program had a transformative effect on Reclamation. Through rigorous peer review, proactive engineering standards, and cutting-edge risk management analysis, the Dam Safety Office and Reclamation's facility managers have regained the confidence of the American public. For decades, Reclamation's Dam Safety Office has stood out internationally as a leader in its field. However, prior to the failure of Teton, Reclamation had already begun looking at our facilities in a different light. New advances in hydrology, meteorology, and geotechnical science showed that dams were much more complex than what they appeared to be on the surface. So, for Reclamation employees, what are the lessons of Teton Dam? How do those lessons resonate today? and what could prevent this from happening again. Long before Teton, Reclamation had established a worldwide reputation. The Bureau was really, you know, it was at the top of the heap, bent dam builders uh, worldwide, and we had all kinds of manuals out there. Our engineers, geologists went all over the world helping other patients. No matter what engineering company you go into, there's the Bureau manuals on the shelf right at the top. And I mean all of them. Reclamation's record is, is second to none. We, we have a very strong construction uh, record. There was also a lot of um, uh, pride, um, uh, honestly, in that Reclamation was able to do all of this and they'd never had a damn failure. Reclamation was hanging its hat on the success of its past or its past experiences and focused on let's keep moving let's keep producing we got a schedule to keep um, in order to get this um, spec out the door well reclamation had a uh, I would say a tremendous reputation as a uh, an engineering uh, operation and maintenance uh, agency uh, but <clears throat> when the dam failed, you know, a very large number of people were uh, impacted adversely. And the Bureau's response to the failure of Teton Dam, the global response, was the development of a Cracker Jack uh, dam safety program. It, it probably made us a better organization. I think it has it was a catalyst for change. The dam's failure triggered an immediate investigation by Reclamation, Congress, two independent review panels, and others. The federal government was under pressure, brought on by those harmed, the public, and the press to find a cause for the catastrophe. The investigations at all levels proved invaluable. Using design and construction records, forensics techniques at the site, and other methods, the technical review teams attempted to pinpoint the exact mechanism of the failure. They revealed a probable cause and through their recommendations established the groundwork for future change. 
But left exposed were more internalized and deep-rooted causes for the failure that affected the agency's performance. Based on past successes, Reclamation had developed a pattern of insular decision-making and centralized processes. Critics say these originated at the design office in Denver and flowed downward into the organization. Reclamation was good. It was very good, but it, all of a sudden we had, 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 had pride. We had tremendous pride. And tremendous pride and ego can be very destructive. It's very hierarchical. The uh, project construction engineer uh, had a, a tremendous amount of, th of authority right there on the project. The chief engineer here at, in uh, Denver was um, king as far as design, and the construction engineer in the field was king as far as construction. And there was very little communication between staffs, especially design engineers and your construction engineer or field en engineers. They weren't encouraged to cross-pollinate. And so there wasn't a lot of interplay between the branches. Uh, it was a very uh, closed system, essentially that went on, and they were on the 12th floor. They were right below us. The guys who designed Teton, I knew because I saw them on the elevators. So when I first came to work for Bureau of Reclamation, in order to have conversations with field personnel, uh, we actually had to fill out a request um, to be able to send a facsimile. Uh, we had to do reports of telephone calls. Um, we had to have permission to make a long distance call. Um, so it was very tightly controlled how much communication there was between the designers and the field personnel. Before Teton, like I told you, you didn't call Denver unless they called you. And the construction engineer called Denver when he really needed something. Outside of that, you had the specifications and you were expect that was your Bible and expect to follow it and that was all the answers were in the spec specifications and the drawings. They were kind of the prince of their own little fiefdom there. <laughs> um, and that carried out throughout the organization. Uh, you people understood that uh, that the project construction engineers and other top-level people in the organization tended to be in the stovepipe of project construction within the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, going back to Teton, the fact that the region had identified four particular features of the site that would be critical to the performance of the satisfactory dam, and the design organization had no records of ever even having read the document uh, and no records to justify how they did it. I don't know how they addressed those issues. The restricted flow of information, or stovepiping, and the lack of documentation and communication between Denver's design branch and the field led to problems. But there were other red flags, more than a decade before Teton. Starting in the 1960s, private, municipal, and federal dams, such as Gibson, Swift, Buffalo Creek, Baldwin Hills and Lower Van Norman Dam had failed or experienced emergency situations which might have mobilized the political will and raised the level of concern for dam safety. These events triggered awareness and national attention toward flood events and earthquakes at dams. Yet at Gibson Dam in Montana, which was overtopped by four feet of water, engineers in the hydrology branch in Denver 
were alarmed. Reclamation realized that we may have underestimated the potential floods that uh, a structure could, could have. Reclamation started going back and re-looking at the floods based on the new uh, meteorology that we had and the new hydrology of old dams and existing dams. By contrast, the 1965 near collapse of Fontenelle Dam, almost identical to the Teton failure, was largely ignored or left unexamined. Fontenelle is brought up as a case and is illustrated of how that, how and why that failed and the parallels and similarities to Teton are remarkable. The, the way the Bureau <clears throat> Embankment Dam section was going of using the same designs, using the same processes as in the field, continued after Fontenelle. And we should have learned there because we had some of the same design engineers on Fontenelle that were <laughs> involved with Tetons. They lowered the reservoir, uh, released the water downstream, and, and uh, was able to control the event and then repair the dam. Reclamation might not have learned all its lessons it should have learned from Fontenelle. But there were many questions left unanswered. What led to this event? How were designers, field personnel, and staff to know the history of what had happened? What process or mechanism could be developed to alert others to see the warning signs before it was too late? One of the credits of Teton legacy that Reclamation had, and probably made Reclamation survive the Teton failure organizationally, is that Reclamation did not shy away from investigating Teton. The first reaction was, we got to find out what went wrong. Besides two legislative acts, a presidential memorandum, and investigation panels from the industry, interior, and Congress, Reclamation was also digging deeply into the causes of failure. These actions translated into marching orders for the agency, and this prompted the search for new talent and new approaches to Reclamation's workflow that would bring about a sea change in Reclamation. Central to this development were the recommendations made by the Department of the Interior's Teton Dam Failure Review Group, or IRG. They identified four major improvements that sowed the seeds of dam safety within reclamation. The focus on dam safety grew out of this and three other initiatives. With these, Reclamation stood ready to launch its own dam safety program. And it just came very uh, apparent, okay, we made some mistakes. Let's learn from the mistakes, let's share the mistakes. Once that happened and the Safety of Dams Act came out after Teton, Reclamation people pulled together very well pulled together tremendously. Since its inception, the Bureau of Reclamation's dam safety program has evolved into a dynamic force throughout the Bureau. The commitment to dam safety extends from the commissioner in Washington to the field staff at every reclamation dam. Though the safety program may now seem commonplace, it's the result of many significant changes that have occurred since Teton. They include 
Principal Designer and Principal Geologist, Technical and Decision Memoranda, Peer Review, Project Management, Comprehensive Facility Review, Emergency Action Planning, and Risk Management. One of the big changes that our internal review team recommended and took place was the establishment of a principal engineer and a uh, responsible geologist. In the aftershock of Teton, this change reconnected the designers with the field people. Those two people were put on, this, especially the principal engineer, were put on the same plane as the construction engineer. And that became the um, active interaction. That's where the work got done for the next 20, 30 years. What it did is it overlaid on the line organization a project organization that ensured there would be somebody um, who had a day-to-day hands-on responsibility for the success of that project. That concept of the principal engineer being on par with the construction engineer uh, was the way the reclamation actually survived over the next 20 years. More than survived, they actually thrived under that process because it brought the work into focus. There was more interplay between uh, the field and the design. Every paragraph was devoured prior to the start of construction. So the field knew every sentence what it meant in the specifications, and that had never been done before. This was a, a, huge, a, a monumental change from the way that we were doing business previously. Um, and, and it was a change that was not easily accepted at first because the line organization still felt that sense of responsibility for the designs. Technical and decision memoranda reinforced standards of accountability and improved information flow. Documentation is very important because that's how the people learn and that's how you know what's going on. Part of the new processes in the division of design and, uh, and, and dam safety was to begin to do documentation uh, that would show what was processed in the design and what alternatives were looked at and what decisions were made. Prior to that period of time, design data had been seen as a personal property and so there were lots of dams uh, in reclamation that did not have uh, records on their design. Those decisions would be um, recorded the, the players would be recorded, they would all sign off on it, and there would be a, a memoranda that would show why the decision was made. That was new to Reclamation. So these uh, younger engineers, were they weren't even aware of how things were done in the past. They were aware of how things should be done. So this new process was their, was their way of doing things. Uh, so it was an incredible sea change. Creation of intensive peer reviews of findings, conclusions, and recommendations of engineering evaluations have become standard industry practice. As a result of Teton, they began a mandate that we have outside consultants look at it, fresh eyes that don't have a, uh, haven't bought off on the previous decisions. You would assign a peer reviewer who had the capability to do whatever that person was doing. And they would have to read and sign off on that. And they were a single, that would be a single peer reviewer. So I think that that's where the 
communication, people talking to other people, field reviews, bringing outside consultants from outside, unbiased, bringing them on site with your designers, your field people, and you thrash it out as to are things looking good or not. The formation of a project management team to oversee the design or construction process for each project has led to increased accountability and sharing of information. Those teams become responsible for the designs and for coordination of the designs. I think it just creates an entirely different dynamic um, that allows people to see more of what's happening and understand how the actions they take or the choices and decisions they make, how it affects other aspects of the design of a project. And, and I think that's the, the big thing. We are accountable to each other. The, the technical staffs are accountable to each other. They talk about things. They interact, they uh, solve problems. Comprehensive facility review evaluates the design and operational history for each dam on eight year and four year cycles. The SEED program, or Safety Evaluation of Existing Dams, leads the industry with its regular examination of reclamation structures. Within that program, we perform all those routine activities to ensure the reliability and health of the facility, which includes examinations, performance monitoring, and evaluations. Comprehensive reviews evaluate the performance and the history of a reclamation structure on an eight-year cycle. If we identify an issue as part of that comprehensive review, such as an issue related to potential flooding or potential seismic loading or a static loading related to seepage through the embankment, we would take a closer look through an issue evaluation. We were already inspecting them to make sure that they would operate okay. But now we expanded those inspections to include safety issues. When our team identifies a recognizable or probable hazard, we engage in a multi-tiered process leading to, if necessary, a corrective action study. In a corrective action study, we examine the root causes of the problem draw up a plan of action, and work with a team of engineers and geologists to find a solution. A corrective action study assures that the public safety is not compromised. Emergency action planning plays an integral role in the operation of reclamation projects. During an emergency, EAPs are a critical life-saving tool. Following Teton and after the flood was taken care of and then they were trying to rebuild the communities, President Carter immediately issued an executive order. And that executive order mandated to the agencies, the federal agencies, that they would instigate emergency action plans we call them emergency preparedness plans on our, uh, for all our dams. These plans contain three major components. A system of response levels applicable across various scenarios, internal and external communication protocols, and criteria for notifying downstream partners and emergency responders. And then the communication directories be developed and communication lines be developed uh, as between our existing dams or any new dam and the local and state uh, law enforcement agencies that would be charged with evacuating the communities.
cracks here. If it shows cracks, great. But... The practice of risk management and risk reduction embraced by reclamation in the 1990s has been elevated from an art to a systematic science. More than a way to quantify risk in a structure, risk management combines assessment and analysis and the commitment of resources into one package. So you cannot make the statement in, in literal terms that a dam is absolutely safe. Because safe, by definition, is the absence of risk. What the risk analysis approach in dam safety brought was the ability for people to think outside the box and to begin thinking about what could actually cause the dam to fail. So dams had to be handled with a, a, a different process and that's, we, we developed this risk-based decision as a, um, hand, a hands-on, easy to understand process that management could understand. I think one of the really important aspects of the dam safety program is that it goes beyond the traditional thinking of design. Um, you can have all of the design standards and manuals and things like that you want to have, but there is no one checklist that you can go through to ensure that a dam is reasonably safe. We should not be so cocky that we think we don't have any risk, so we should show um, what the risk was and include risk in our decision making. The Dam Safety Office implements policy and coordinates and directs dam safety efforts within reclamation. The dam safety team in Denver and designees in each region initiate comprehensive annual reviews for each dam according to a master schedule and provides briefings of the line managers up to the regional directors. Reclamation also responds to observations of significant changes in dam behavior to quickly assess changes in our understanding of risk at that dam. The Reclamation Dam Safety Program is recognized worldwide as the standard for dam safety and risk management. Post-Teton Reclamation has re-established its trust with the American people. It has developed transparency in operations, raised visibility with the program, and fostered openness to external review, all to assure that reclamation dams don't pose an unreasonable risk to the public. For those guiding reclamation's future, some words of advice. There are very few structures that we deal with as a society that have, could have a greater impact to a community than, than the dams. It's a, it's a major responsibility nobody takes lightly. It's essentially, what we learned was that you have to look and study the, the unimaginable, the worst case. Question authority. I think, uh, you know, where, wherever you are in the organization, empower yourself to express your own opinion. And uh, in, in reclamation, as I guess if I were going into any organization today, I would uh, encourage people, you know, for, the, for their own job satisfaction. <laughs> um, Use your skills, uh, and if your idea is different than someone else's, uh, test it out. Ask them. Give your give your suggestion. Uh, ask to be uh, to have your opinion considered. Absolutely, the number one priority in this agency 
with all these structures is to make absolutely certain that they're safe and that they are producing the benefits for which they were authorized and for which they were built. For those that are new to the agency, you're coming to an agency that's got a rich history uh, and pride associated with what the agency has been able to accomplish. Uh, and coming to the agency, you've inherited a vast infrastructure. As being public servants, it's your responsibility to help carry out the public trust of protecting uh, those uh, facilities that um, you're now um, working with. I challenge you to learn Reclamation's history, to be able to uh, work together and look at the processes that need to be in place as we continue to be challenged in the future.